So good evening, everyone. And we have with us Karan and Seren. And they are in the current cohort uh, of the MED program at uh, Harvard. And we are um, looking at, you know, hearing from them about their stories, about their journey so far, what brought them to the program and what is the whole curriculum like. So welcome, Seren. Welcome, Karan. And thank you for taking out the time from such a busy schedule. Thanks, Shruti. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Thank not. you. It, it is a pleasure to be here. Yes. So, Mr. and and Karan, please share your introductions. Tell us, you know, about your career journey so far. And Mr. we can you know start with you on this uh, front. Yeah. So, I actually have a background uh, doing my undergrad at business school, um, and I really focused on technology and data analytics at the time. And so I started my early career in consulting, which is quite classic for business school students, especially those who don't know what they're doing. But um, after sort of working in the field, I had the opportunity to start working in behavioral economics space, which is really applied behavioral science, psychology um, to business problems. Because if you think about it, every problem in the world boils down to human behavior. Um, so after working consulting in that space, I then moved to Google where I was able to work as the behavioral insights lead first across Canada and then working with the Americas and then later based out of Singapore working across APAC. And there uh, my job was really actually to marry the behavioral sciences and data analytics to help solve our clients' problems. I was actually looking at my master's program um, for the last five years and hoping to apply. And this was just the lucky year that I chose to do so and got in. Um, but I was really wondering, you know, how can I make an impact on society? Where is the right place to do that with my skill set? For me, it became apparently obvious that I wanted to start with young children and helping them develop not just their learning capabilities, and but also their social emotional learning so that they can thrive amongst others in society. For me, I wanted to learn how to apply behavioral science um, to the education space, which is why I applied to the um, human development program uh, within the Harvard uh, Ed School, which focuses on psychology, neuroscience, and its applications to education. So that's that's me in a nutshell. Over to you, Karen. And Karen, please share your journey with us. You, I know you have right. uh, very long um, you know, interaction with the business schools as well as education as such. I would like to hear about your journey and what brings you to the MED program. So just a disclaimer, um, everything has happened by chance in my life and in entire career what I've had. I completed my undergrad in mass media uh, because I wanted to become a photographer and I was a photojournalist with uh, Times of India back in my hometown during high school. I was like, so let's pursue mass media and then figure that out. So while I was pursuing my mass media, I was also working. I did almost seven internships and life projects. So that's where actually it got me great insights in the industry. Yes, academics is amazing, but also you need to go out in the industry and get to know what's been happening currently, right? And unfortunately, uh, I don't know how the curriculum is based right now, but during our time, the curriculum was very old. Like we just had one paragraph about digital marketing in the entire course of three years. Right. And today, everything is about digital marketing. And I was lucky enough to actually work with Bain & Company after my undergrad itself, soon after my undergrad. But when I was working with Bain for a year, I realized marketing is something I'm really good at or I would really want, want to pursue. But let's look at some other industries. I could not get into FMCG because it requires MBA, it requires uh, other skill sets as well, sales and other skill set. But when I looked at education as a place to be in, I got to work with Ezra Bakoli uh, way back when they were starting in India, almost like a decade ago. And that's how I decided to stay in the education industry itself. And after working with them, I moved to a couple of other business schools in India itself. Uh, so other one was it's num almost like, it's, it's literally the number one business school in India. Another one was had multi campuses based out of Mumbai, Dubai, uh, Sydney, as well as Singapore. And then last, I was working with a, a business school based out of Toronto in Canada. And that's when, uh, during the entire journey of 10 years, I realized, great, this is a beautiful industry to stay in. India has a lot of potential. We, have, we are seeing a lot of international universities setting up their shops in India. They're opening up their campuses in India. How do you set yourself apart, right? Because pursuing a mass media, 
I did not have that formal education, in, literally in education as well, because we are used to the BA and the MA program in India, but that very focused towards becoming a teacher, right? So if you want to become a teacher, MA programs or BA programs in India works really, really great. But when you see education as, let's say, business or let's say disrupting the market, right? So how, how do you get over the top? So that's where I actually came across uh, the uh, master's in education program at Harvard. And I happened to apply it. Uh, this was literally my first year uh, applying uh, to the program. And so glad that I eventually made it. Excellent. That's, that's a great journey that has brought you to the master's in education. So I also want to understand, you know, when you were considering this program, what other locations did you evaluate? What are the other options that one can, you know, look at? And then how did you square down on this particular program? So when, when I was looking for master's in education program, on the side, I was also looking at the MBA programs as well, uh, because 10 years in the industry, I've just completed my undergrad. And the funny part used to be whenever I used to conduct these sessions, right? Like one of the sessions that you are conducting, or like a number of webinars, meeting students uh, offline as well. Everybody used to be like, oh, where did you complete your master's from? Or where did you complete your MBA from? I was like, no, I've not done my MBA. I've not done a master's yet. So that was always a question. And finally, after 10 years, I realized that I feel the need because I was looking at the top management positions after 10 years. And that's when I realized, okay, I need to understand how to run a business, right? So that's where I felt the need of pursuing the master's program. And I was looking at the MBA programs. Uh, I did apply to two business schools in Europe. And I was also considering to pursue my master's in India as well. But when I came across a master's in education at Harvard, I was very sure if I'm applying for education, I'm only applying to Harvard and no other business school. Uh, it's, it's either you go for the best one or else you just uh, continue working, right? So I was very focused there. And uh, I did get through the business schools in Europe as well. But eventually when it came to applying, uh, like uh, starting my classes, I actually thought uh, Harvard could be one of the uh, best programs. But over to you, sir. I have a little bit of a similar story, but I do want to be helpful to everyone watching. Okay, I'll tell you my story and then some recommendations. So for me, actually back five, six years ago, when I was uh, back consulting at PwC, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into neuroscience. And so I took actually the Harvard Extension School master's class called the Neuroscience of Learning by um, Professor Tracy Tokohama Espinosa. It was a life-changing class. Like I have to say highest quality class because not only does she teach you the neuroscience of learning and how to conduct extremely powerful education protocols, help you understand the brain, um, but she also uses those concepts in the way she designs the class. So the class itself is like an art piece. Um, so after that class, I knew I wanted to continue in academia in this space. Um, but because I had also just gotten into Google, I delayed that application for the last five to six years. Um, so for me, what I had done, though, in that time was keep track of the um, offline, like the on-campus master's program, because my professor had recommended that I don't continue with the online program and actually think of the uh, campus program specifically if I want to continue in academia. Um, and this is back in 2018 as well, so pre-pandemic. Um, so I just kept track of this program the entire time. So I was very familiar with the professors. I was very familiar with uh, the teachings, the classes. And so when it came to time to write the application, I was very ready to explain exactly why I was a fit for this program. And I think for anyone applying to any program, that is the number one ingredient to having a successful application is why this program, why now, and why you? And if you can answer that powerfully, then I think you have a very strong shot. At the same time, I was working at Google Singapore, so I had um, very long working hours. And uh, so I actually, quite frankly, just didn't have the energy to apply to other schools. I did research them. Um, but I will tell you the ones that I, that really caught my eye. So University of Columbia has a really fantastic program. Um, Teachers College, UPenn has a really great program. Stanford has a great program. And so I was looking through them, but I really couldn't find one that really spoke to giving me the opportunity to learn about really the neuroscience and psychology element on its own 
plus with education. And because there was no master's of psychology at Harvard, this was kind of really the best opportunity for me to dive deeper. So I also just applied to Harvard. Um, and when you do that, uh, I think it makes it, you, you focus very powerfully on your application. So I spent like six months on this application process, very focused, um, making sure that I, you know, did everything I could to get in. I might have something to add here as Sarah and spoke, right? Uh, the way she was actually choosing the program. So in my case, similarly, uh, again, when we spoke about the BA and the MA program in India, the program which I'm, so both of us, and for the record, both of us are actually pursuing the same master's in education program, but it has different channels to it. So she's in human development education and I'm part of the ELOE program, which is around education leadership and entrepreneurship as well. And I'm very specifically going ahead with the higher education part of it, right? So being in higher education, going ahead with higher, higher education itself. And how do you bring changes in a higher education institute? That's something what I'm looking forward to. And the more you research, like I'm so glad to know this, and like you literally went through so many schools before applying to Harvard. I just stuck around with two, like UPenn and Harvard, that's it. But UPenn, I did not complete my application. And uh, a lot of... Like these schools mean in India, they might not have these very uh, like specialized tracks. And this is very specific to what you would want to do. There's so many, I mean, the spectrum for education is so broad. You can just pick up, let's say K-12 and you can do so many things versus higher education as well. So that's something really to look forward to. Yes, and that brings me to my next question. That's what That was what I had actually in mind to ask about, you know, what's the curriculum like? What type of tracks can one follow? And, you know, what is the end goal that, you know, you're coming from different fields altogether, you still find the same program to be fitting into your career path. So how's the curriculum uh, down here? Yeah, oh this, this is the beauty of this program and why I chose it is because it's not a rigid curriculum like most grad schools where you have to take specific paths, where you have to do a thesis for half of the year, for example, this is actually um, almost like a choose your own journey. So there are very specific kind of uh, programs that you apply to, right? So there's several um, off the top of my memory, other than, you know, human development, which used to actually be called mind, brain and behavior education. There is the um, education, leadership and entrepreneurship, there's the policy track, there's teaching licensure, there's a counseling licensure track. What else? Am I missing anything, Karen? Uh, LDIT. Oh, and learning uh, design, the learning yeah. design and technology track. And of course, you get in and you're inspired by all of these different types of courses and these fantastic professors. And the best part is that you can actually pursue them. So for me, because I have a very specific goal set for my time here, I'm taking my classes anchored on two themes, not just human development and psychology, but also entrepreneurship. And because the core required classes are only, um, I think it's nine credits that we have to take or nine or 10, 12 that we have to take in our program, uh, the rest are open to whatever you choose to take. So I'm taking a lot of education courses, um, actually from Curran's program. Um, I'm taking some design and technology program courses. And the um, other fantastic part is that you can do cross-registration. So you can take MIT courses, you can take Harvard Business School courses, Kennedy courses. So you have basically the entire Harvard open to you. If you wanted to pursue the majority of your classes from the MBA type classes, you could if you wanted to and really almost get like a, a semi-dual degree. Um, and so I think that's the really exciting part about this is that your goals coming in might even change and you have the opportunity to change your mind even when you're in the program. That's great. And Karan, yeah. would you like to add to this? Absolutely. I guess she covered it wonderfully. And that was quite a surprise for me as well. Uh, when I So just last week we had our course selection, so the shopping week, what we call and it was overwhelming, to be honest. There were so many courses. I want to do this. And then you realize, as we spoke, right, 42 credits is the minimum what you have to do to graduate and 56 is the maximum. And uh, you literally want to do all the courses, but it may not, just not fit in the right schedule, right? We have business school open for us, Kennedy, and all other schools as well. But it may not fit with your schedule of what you have. So, uh, again, you have to be very mindful about 
okay, this is what I need to learn and this is what I want to learn, right? So that's something what uh, you could actually look into. But one good thing actually happened in my program, not too sure if it was a similar case for you, Saran, as well. So for ELOE, which is the Education Leadership Organization and Entrepreneurship Program, they asked us to go through a self-assessment tool. And again, it's not a test, it's just a tool, right? And very different than the other assessment tools I have done in the past. So it actually gives you an entire range of what are the competent, uh, competencies you would, uh, you're good at and what are the things you need to work on. Mm-hmm. And it will suggest you courses similarly. Okay, we see that this is something which you need to build your uh, like expertise on. So why don't you take this course? So they do most of the job uh, for you as well. So as uh, Saren mentioned that you might have like a specific track in your mind and but you might change as well. So it's totally, totally fine to do that. Uh, and th- that's that's the beauty of the entire Harvard program. Like the entire Harvard University is open for you, be it business school, MIT, or any any other thing there as well. Sounds very yeah. interesting. Just to also add, even the PhD classes are open to you. The undergrad sometimes are open to you if you want like a one on one class. Um, and you're assigned a, an advisor. So on top of you know these amazing tools, you have an advisor to guide you throughout the year to help you get into opportunities into classes, talk to professors, um, and support you figuring out what you want to do throughout the year. And in terms of the application process, you need to know why you want to do a course and, you know, what are you planning to take from the course? So the application process does take a lot of time. So what would you suggest people who are planning to apply to the program and especially also eyeing the scholarship? And if you'd like to add to that, you know, for international applicants, the scholarship is also a big uh, thing that um, really draws them to a program and really facilitates it for the international applicants as well. It's something that is very, very important. So how, how, do, how do you go about the process? Do you want to start? Because- so it's about the application process. How would you suggest people to take up the application process and also, you know, factor in, in the scholarship process? So what really okay. brought you the scholarship and how did you take up the process at all? Okay. Um, I would say ideally, even before the year that you want to apply, start doing your research. Just start looking at the programs, reading the websites, um, and even feel free to email like professors whose work that you see might be aligned to your interests. Try to get some exposure and engagement with the program itself. See, I know friends who actually joined the program who had come and done the campus tour, come and met teachers before, like they really immerse themselves in this life uh, before even applying. And uh, for me, that experience was my relationship with my professor, Tracy, and so uh, as well as my classmates, because I had a few classmates from that Harvard Extension Master of Psychology program who ended up taking the master's that I'm doing now. And so I was able to talk to them and learn from them. I think that's important because you need to understand and visualize exactly what you're trying to get into so that you can talk about it as if you're already in alignment with that program. And so I would say that's step number one before even doing anything. Step number two is figuring out your why. And I think that can be really hard because a lot of us, you know, have a vague idea as to why we want to do something, but you have to sit down and really write down, okay, Ask yourself some big questions like, if this was all I could do for the rest of my life, what would I do, right? And is that an alignment? Or if I had $50 million, you know, what would I choose to do with my time now that money's not a problem? And so for me, um, I was lucky to have been forced into answering those questions because when I got into Google, um, that was one of my interview questions. What would you do with $50 million? Uh, and this is Natasha Walji's favorite question. She's uh, one of the best leaders at Google. Uh, and so that forced me to reflect. And I just knew instinctively it would be to focus on education and focus on education reform, focusing on transforming society by transforming um, the way our children learn and enter into society. And so um, for me, that's why it was clear, this program. And then the why now is also important in that what part of your journey makes sense to apply now versus a different time. Um, Because for me, I wanted to apply again since 2018, but I waited and waited and waited because I was like, this is not the right moment of my journey. And what I was able to do in those six years was actually build the experiences I needed to apply to the program and 
um, you know, the relationships as well, as well as the experience and education that I was lacking. And so once I moved to Singapore, which is such a big hub for education, I did work in education, then it was the right time to apply for me. And what was what uh, were your suggestions about the application process and the scholarship? I, I guess Seren has completely covered the topic in terms of what you should be doing. Great, great uh, work there, Seren. Just a couple of uh, points, and this would be more Indian-focused because this is what I've seen mostly in India with the students. Uh, and I'm not too sure, Shruti, if you also face this, when students are planning for their master's or they're planning for their MBA program, the first focus what they have is, oh, let's prepare for GMAT or GRE. Let's get a score. And then let's decide which college or which school I want to go to, right? I will score like 720, 750 in my GMAT, and then I will apply to, let's say, which schools I'm eligible for, right? So that can be a good approach uh, as well. But something uh, other than that could be listing down the programs you would want to go to, right? And continuing to whatever Seren said, do the entire research the way uh, Seren just mentioned, right? So list down the programs and then see even if that program requires a GMAT or a GRE. Or what is the score? Maybe you are aiming at 750, but the average score for that business school could be 680, right? So you can eventually uh, go ahead with your uh, GMAT and GRE prep and the other prep, what she mentioned about the uh, answering the essay questions as well. So that, that could be an approach as well. So in my case, personally, I wanted to opt for GMAT, GRE because I was planning for uh, these schools. But surprisingly, for master's in education program, Harvard, they do require a GRE score but they can wave it off if you have a decent profile. And maybe that's what happened in my case. It was optional. So they kind of waved it off because I've spent enough time in education. And as Saran mentioned, like know your why. What do you want to do uh, after the program, right? So that kind of worked. So not always maybe the GMAT GRE may be the best route, but also look at the program first and then go for GMAT GRE. The second part of the question is scholarship. So the scholarship process at Harvard is fairly simple. Uh, you once you submit your application and before you get the outcome of, uh, before you get a, a decision from Harvard, they will reach out to you to understand where you are financially. How much have you made in that year? And uh, if you are being supported by your family, if you have a spouse, how much your spouse is earning, how, how much are your investments? Uh, what's the money in bank and other things as well. So I did apply for uh, financial aid and I got through. And I got some good, decent financial aid as well. And that's where I was like, okay, fine, how it makes sense. Because when I was looking at the fin finances around the program, it was difficult. And coming from India, converting, and we have this habit of converting your INR into USD and USD into INR. That's, that's a challenge every single day, even I'm, what I'm facing right now. But I was like, let's apply. Let's see if you get it. And because the, uh, getting the finances in place is my future problem, right? And when I got the admit, I was like, okay, the future problem is here. How do I finance my program? And I did get the scholarship, but I was also prepared to get an education loan from India, but it kind of worked in my favor that I did not have to apply for loan from India. I got decent scholarship here. Harvard itself, they gave us a loan as well. So I picked up Harvard's loan and that kind of covered my entire tuition cost. At Harvard as well. So they are very supportive. And just like any other uh, Ivy League school, if they like you, they will make sure that they put you in the class, be it financial help, uh, be it any other support you need before the program, during the program. And I'm sure after the program as well, they're just there for you uh, in, in, in that case, specifically. That's great. Yeah. It's actually a very inspiring journey, you know. You started from a different point in your career and now you are at Harvard and pursuing a master's in education and looking at a career in education. Very, very inspiring. A lot of people who I meet or, you know, usually we talk about is an MBA journey or an executive MBA path. And this is this is a very unique path and you're very sure that, yes, this, I belong here. That, that's excellent. What, what, what would be your, you know, advice or let's say the insights that you would like to share for, let's say, people who are watching the program, this our discussion today. Do you want to go first? I have, I mean, so much advice. I think the, the number one advice is to not get in your own way mm -hmm. and to believe that you can get in or just dare to try. For me, once upon a time, I didn't think that I could ever get into Google, ever get into Harvard, but I just tried. 
and it was good enough. And so for me, I always go by the philosophy of if you don't try, it's always going to be a, a no, right? So you might as well just try. <laughs> and now I'm trying to pivot into the entrepreneurship space. And there's people who've been serial entrepreneurs their whole lives, right? And I'm like, oh, can I do this? But I'm like, well, I should just try you know, why not? So I think that philosophy is something I would advise people as much as you're actually, it could be you. Um, and so that's my number one advice. And then my number two advice is um, Harvard specifically isn't necessarily looking for what you have accomplished. And I think a lot of students that apply focus their application on trying to make themselves look very successful. Here's what I've achieved, right? But actually, Harvard is more looking for who you are and what you can do and how the program can help you do what you want to do. And so focusing your application around that is going to make you more powerful than saying, here's why I'm so successful and here's why I'm great, right? And it's it's a very natural tendency to want to prove ourselves in that way. Um, but I've seen that the most successful stories and applications and essays uh, really just focus on, again, like, why me, why now, and why the program? And Karen, what are your thoughts and suggestions for the applicants? So this is something what I've been uh, telling people when, so I'll give the same advice. Don't self-reject yourself. There is no specific structure an applicant should be. I know we see student profiles. Oh, this person went to PNG. Oh, this person got 750. And this person has done this. Leadership activities and everything. And we try to compare ourselves unknowingly. Don't uh, self-reject yourself. Try. The answer, if it's no, it's no. But when you try, the uh, li literally, the chances are 50% for you to get in. So and the second part is what I want to talk about is, and, and something which I've actually faced personally, and at Harvard, I'm sure Seren would agree to this, a lot of professors and faculty, they have actually spoken about this, is having that imposter syndrome. And it is so common. I've had that uh, in the past. I had that uh, after coming to Harvard as well. Do I really belong here? And there have been thoughts like uh, when you're just taking a walk on the campus at night, um, it's beautiful though. And you're just taking a walk on the campus. They're like, am I really in Harvard? Am I here? Like, uh, because what Harvard we knew outside of the academics was what we've seen in series and in movies. Oh, that's what Harvard is, right? And so you always have this self doubt. Oh, I'm like, am I the right person? But trust me, you are. And they have chosen you for a reason. And admissions team, they are very particular about the students that uh, come in here. So you do belong here. And just don't self-reject yourself on, on the basis of your profile, what you have. But that's that's another thing. And uh, this, I guess, Seren will agree because Seren and I, we always talk about this, uh, being in our 30s and actually going through the entire program. And it's difficult to take a break because the first question which comes to our mind is what about the opportunity cost? Hey, listen, I would have made XX dollars or XX iron or black. So it's, it's more about uh, go beyond when it comes to looking at ROI. It's not just how much you're making right now, how much are you investing, and how much you, you will be earning. Calculate Calculating what your post-master or post-MBA salary as an ROI, yes, that's a good formula to apply to. But it's also taken into consideration the network what you're building here, the friends what you're meeting here, the, the kind of experience what you get here as well. And that's something, again, you don't have a tangible value to it, but I guess that even that should be included when you are looking at ROI as well. Like after my uh, master's program, I may be withdrawing the same salary if I go back to India or if I stay back here uh, to opt for my OPD as well. I may be uh, withdrawing the same salary, but the kind of experience what I've had right now and the way I will be helping students going forward after this program, that is something which is a major part of ROI. And I guess no number or no money can actually match that level as well. So when it comes to ROI, I look beyond the post MBA and post master's salary. It's always long term and it's more towards, you know, what do you really want to do in life? So at some point in time, you have to take a call and, you know, just dive in. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. It's so exciting to understand that you can really choose your way once you get into the master's of education program. And uh, looking forward to having more interactions with you. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm super happy to be here and answer any questions in the future as well. Thank you.